Hello, welcome to your daily briefing, December the 14th, 2018. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you continue to lead us day by day. You continue to reveal to us the events that are taking place around us. Today, as we continue our study, we ask for your continued guidance and for the strength that will be needed to stand against the storm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been talking quite a bit about the evangelicals of today, and I came across an article found on the Patheos website, that's P-A-T-H-E-O-S, published March the 12th, 2018. The writer of the article is D.G. Hart, H-A-R-T. The title of the article is, How Much Do Christians Care About Theology and Should They? Again, the title, How Much Do Christians Care About Theology and Should They? Here's the article. Massimo, Massimo Faglioli is a theologian who teaches at Villanova. With a name like that, you might expect him to be on the Roman Catholic team of Western Christianity. Since he writes regularly at Commonweal and is a defender of the Second Vatican Council, he is also a nemesis for some traditionalists or conservative Roman Catholics, yes, for the uninformed Roman Catholic is not synonymous with conservative or tradition. Yet, for all the differences between him and me, as a Reformed Protestant of decidedly anti-modernist sensibilities, Faglioli puts his finger on a problem that bedevils Christian higher education, both Roman Catholic and Protestant. Here is his take on the Roman Catholic side of the matter. This rise of Catholic anti-liberalism marks a regression in the ability of Catholics to understand the problem of the state and of politics in our age. But it also says something about the state of Catholic theology, especially in America. I believe that the fate of Catholic theology in the Western world is inseparable from the fate of academic theology. In order to survive and flourish, theology needs universities, publishers, and journals. You can just about imagine the church surviving intellectually without academic theology, but I think it would be the poorer for it, especially in the American system, where there is no constitutionality, constitutionally established church, or academic theology. And academic theology is part of a religious and ecclesiastical Catholic establishment. But we cannot assume the institutions that support academic theology will last forever. And for Catholic academic theology to be healthy, it cannot depend entirely on a few great institutions like Notre Dame and Georgetown. It also needs the many smaller Catholic colleges, many of which are now struggling to stay open. The present wave of anti-liberalism does tell us something about what's happened to liberal Catholic theology and religious studies department in the past few years. As a faculty member in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Villanova University, I found what Archbishop Charles Chaput had to say about his lecture here significant. Someone asked him, about the role of John Paul II's Apostolic Constitution Ex Corde Ecclesiastica in Catholic universities today. He answered that the document, issued by the U.S. bishops in 1999 to implement that Corde, had no teeth. This was as frank an acknowledgement of the estrangement between Catholic theologians and the Church as one could ask for. What happened in the years between the Lando Lake Statement of 1967 and the implementation of Ex Corde Ecclesiastae, Emancipation Theology, from ecclesiastical control? But it also em emancipated the Catholic Church from academic theology. Catholic scholars of literature, art, history, etc., 
could teach a kind of Catholic studies that focused on the high cultural ideas of the Christian West and largely ignored or rejected post-conciliar theology. The work of Catholic theologians became less and less important to many Catholic leaders, that would be bishops, the public intellectuals, or the big donors, who instead turned their attention to initiatives that addressed the culture wars. Here's what Faglioli illuminates about Protestant higher education. Now let me pause to say that what these men are saying, and you know it sounds a little bit academic, but it is an important article. They're saying that these people are moving in the direction away from their theology or their belief systems to what is described here as a culture war. In other words, it's not based on the word, it's based on a cultural understanding. Remember what we said the, the topic is? How much do Christians care about theology and should they? So what Mr. Hart is saying that these guys, both the Protestants and the Catholics, they're not moving in the direction of understanding what the Word says and living by that. Rather, they're moving in the direction of a culture war. Continuing what Mr. Hart is saying, he says this, here's what Feglioli eliminates about Protestant higher education. For starters, evangelicals have even less invested in academic theology than Roman Catholics. Plenty of Protestants self-identifying as Christians, more from an encounter through a Billy Graham crusade or following a televangelist than they do through sitting under the ministry of the Word each Sunday, learning the catechism of their communion, or engaging in family worship during the week. Theology has much less of a presence in popular Protestantism than it did in the official sectors of Roman Catholicism. You understand what he's saying? Even the people who call themselves Protestants and are really not studying the Word, they came in through some Billy Graham crusade or, or listening to a guy on the television on Sundays. Continuing. That means that when it comes to the mantra, popular since Francis Schaeffer came to the States on the coattails of the Beatles, the integration of faith and learning, most of the reflection that seeks to inform scholarship with Christianity, comes much more from personal experience than actually theological training or Bible study. You may be an expert in imperial Chinese pottery, but your understanding of doctrine and scripture may be limping along with the college and career Sunday school class. In which case, Christians who should be opposed to populist anti-intellectuals because of all the Greek, Hebrew, Latin philosophy and theology needed to reckon with some of Christianity's more challenging claims, wind up challenging the same kind of impatience with intellectual elitism that pervades even the corridors of secular colleges and universities, as explained by Benjamin Peloff. The inner workings of academia are opaque, except for the fancy titles and ceremonial self-congratulation, the pomp and circumstance that remain the most public-facing aspects of the academic life. No wonder, then, that some assume that expertise is little more than the public display of personal opinions, and that they merely need to give those opinions an institutional thought. Much like their approach to party politics or the administrative state, those riding Trump's coattails are not seeking to tear the building down so much as to fill it with tenants who look like them. What they're missing is how much work is invested in producing actual knowledge, how a degree is the sum of that labor and not a piece of paper. Such hard-headed effort, which seeks to account for an accommodation of a data rather than excluding it, is the hallmark of expertise. Peloff may be forgetting the older anti-Elysium in American higher education that accompanied Jesse Jackson's leading the chant at Stanford University 
Hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. But whether an intellectual height comes from the left or the right, it's not something that Christians, Protestants, or Roman Catholics should encourage. Otherwise, the Trinitarian nature of God is just one more, one more truth to abandon. So notice what the writer of the article is saying, that they're Christians today, both Catholics and Protestants, who really are not spending much time studying the Word of God. They, they have gotten engaged in a culture war. And even those who spend some time in, in the colleges, in the Catholic schools or in the other schools in study, they come out with a piece of paper rather than being academically prepared for the task at hand. Now that is a serious matter, and it lines up with the fact that there are many today who call themselves evangelicals or call themselves Christians, but they don't go to church that often. They go to church on holidays or special days, but uh, as the topic asks, how much do Christians care about theology? What is it that they believe? And it is pretty clear, my brother, my sister, that some of the behaviors and some of the choices that we make are not based on the word. We're not following the, the counsel of Christ, but rather we seek to fill, let me read it for you again, we seek to fill our institutions with tenants who look like us. Now that's serious, because there are those today who call themselves Christians, but they're basing that upon their cultural understanding of what their upbringing might be or what their ethnic um, exposure might be. Now this is something that has happened not just in the United States of America, but unfortunately has happened globally. And as we go forward during this program, we will see that this is something that is very real today. And the question that I have to ask you before we go any further today is, do you understand what you believe? Are you a Christian because you are a follower of Christ? And do you have an understanding of what that means? Your membership or your affiliation with the organization to which you are affiliated, do you understand what those, what those positions are and where they are found in God's Word? In other words, do you know what you believe why you believe it, and where to find it? Or are you just a part of an, a, an association? Have you come in through a crusade and follow a televangelist and, uh, and associate with that? Or are you really convicted personally concerning the truth that you know to be truth because you have studied it? Our second article today is found in the Guardian website, and it was published on the 18th of February, 2018. The writer of that article is Randall Balmer. His last name is spelled B-A-L-M-E-R. The title of the article is, Under Trump, America's Religious Right is Rewriting Its Code of Ethics. Let me give you that topic again. Under Trump. America's religious right is rewriting its code of ethics. Here's some of that article. The religious right's wholesale embrace of the Republican Party and of Donald J. Trump, both as a candidate and as president, has necessitated a rewriting of evangelical ethics. Here's a summary with annotations. Number one, lying is all right as long as it serves a higher purpose. Yes, we know all about that business, about not bearing false witness in the Ten Commandments, but that was a very long time ago. Can we get beyond that? Truth and truthiness are overrated. After all, did it really matter that the birther nonsense was hokum? Not at all. It enraged those godless liberals and launched our brother in Christ, Donald Trump, toward the presidency. 
And all those websites fact-checking our president, claiming that he told more than 2,000 lies this first year in office, big deal. He's also pro-life, and he's trying to root out transgender folks in the military, so cut the guy some slack. Besides, that same website that tracks lying concluded that Barack Obama told 28 lies during his two terms in office. So there. Democrats are such hypocrites. Number two. Now, of course, I'm reading the annotations that the author of the article, not me, the author of the article, is saying that the religious right is rewriting its code of ethics. So the first one was lying is all right as long as it serves a higher purpose. The second one, it's no problem to be married more than, well, twice. Let's be clear here. We're not talking about polygamy. Sorry, Mitt, only serial marriages. This revision has been a long time in the making. Yes, Jesus said, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Through the 1970s, we evangelicals ostracized anyone who was divorced, let alone divorced and remarried. But then we decided to ditch a family man and family and fellow evangelical in favor of a divorced and remarried Hollywood actor in 1980. Once that barrier was breached, we concluded that, hey, if two marriages are okay, why not three? Number three, immigrants are scum. We grant that Jesus said something about welcoming the stranger and feeding the hungry, and Leviticus says the alien who resides with you should be to you as the citizen among you. You should love the alien as yourself. But our careful study of scriptural texts has led us to conclude that the Almighty had Norwegians in mind, not Mexicans or Salvadorians. Next, vulgarity is a sign of strength and resolve. The President's scat scatological comments about Haiti and African nations provided a welcome relief to the rhetoric of those coddling the so-called dreamers. As Robert Jeffries, pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, noted, Brother Trump was right on target. Next, white lives matter, much more than others. Our political movement began in the late 1970s in opposition to desegregation, although our slate of hand to persuade everyone to organize to outlaw abortion was nothing short of, well, miraculous. On racial matters, we are also indebted to our colleague Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council, who did business with David Duke, longtime leader of the Ku Klux Klan, way back in 1996. We took the Trump at his word when he declared the ranks of white supremacists included some very fine people. Perkins also addressed the Council of Conservative Citizens, the Uptown Klan, when he was a state representative in Louisiana. Therefore. We had no problem whatsoever with Steve Bannon or with the President's statement blaming the violence in Charlottesville on many sides, both the white supremacists and those demonstrating against them. We took the brother Trump at his word when he declared that the ranks of white supremacists and neo-Nazis included some very fine people. That's why none of us criticized him. Besides, he wants to jettison the Johnson Amendment to allow us to campaign from the pulpits while retaining our tax exemptions. Next, there's no harm in spending time with porn stars. Once again, we have a precedent. David Vitter, the Republican senator from Louisiana and outspoken champion of family values, whose phone number appears in the date book of a Washington madam and who continue to enjoy our support regarding that messy situation with Stormy Daniels, Think of the opportunities for the president to share what Franklin Graham calls his concern for Christian values. We're confident that as details emerge, we learn that the brother Trump was discussing his theological perspectives on human depravity and the second coming. Next, it's all right for adults to date children. We're not yet prepared to embrace pedophilia, but... We see nothing wrong with a 30-something attorney trawling the local shopping mall for teenage dates. After all, 
Didn't Jesus say, suffer the little children to come unto me? Roy Moore was simply being Christ-like. Besides, he opposes abortion, and he asks their mother for permission. Next, the ends justify the means. Enough said. Too many Americans think of evangelicals as dogmatic and uncompromising, so we are eager to demonstrate that when it comes to ethical standards, we can indeed be flexible, very flexible. Now that article was written, as we said before, by Randall Balmer. It's found in The Guardian, published the 18th of February, 2018, and the title of the article, Under Trump, America's Religious Right is Rewriting Its Code of Ethics. And it gives here a number of annotations in that article. Lying is all right as long as it serves a higher purpose. Number two, it's no problem to be married more than, well, twice. Number three, immigrants are scum. Number four, vulgarity is a sign of strength and resolve. Number four, white lives matter much more than others. Number six, there's no harm in spending time with porn stars. Number seven, it's all right for adults to date children. Number eight, the end justifies the means. Indeed, it would seem, as you read the article found in The Guardian, American religious right is rewriting its code of ethics, that that lines up with the first article that we read that was found in Pathios. How much do Christians care about theology? And should they? Apparently, the example and the counsel of Christ no longer applies, for they are indeed rewriting their code of ethics. This is a serious matter, and you and I need to understand how serious it is. There is one other article that I'd like you to hear, but we'll probably take a look at this in our next session. It's also found in the Pathios, and the title of the article is, Is Trump Our Cyrus? You know, the Medo-Persian Cyrus, in the Word of God. We will take a look at that in our next session. You and I need to understand that there are changes taking place. The concept of Christianity no longer applies to a biblical model, but rather to a cultural confrontation. And you and I must be ready to face what is coming. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you continue to warn us, day by day, constantly, concerning where we stand and what is about to take place. And we ask that you would help us to spend some time with your word so that we might know what we believe, why we believe it, and where to find it. And when it comes to the place where we stand alone, that we will know that we stand with you, unmoved. Give us that strength, that endurance, and that faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been your daily briefing. December the 14th, 2018.